what's the first advice that i give to any candidate before they begin with their technical interview don't jump on to coding directly make sure that you explain your approach the choice of data structures and algorithms with logical reasoning and then only move to coding similarly whenever you are starting with a project or any product development make sure you don't jump onto it without proper planning now what do i mean by proper planning i think this video is going to be an interesting journey for you all we are going to talk about software architecture design what things you should be cautious about while planning your software what things are important from a technical perspective as well as a customer's perspective and so on but which product should i talk about for this demonstration i think we should choose a social media platform and at this point i know you have guessed it right it's going to be twitter my most favorite social media platform so we are going to go through a broad overview of designing twitter's software architecture from scratch let's begin the first part of any software architecture plan is to gather the requirements what features should your product support we need to understand this from different perspectives like what are the pain points of the customer what is the customer looking for what are the wants and needs how feasible are these features from a technical point of view we should gather all of these requirements before jumping on to the architecture design understanding technical feasibility will not always be as straightforward in the beginning you might be required to travel further down the road of designing the product you may require to break your software architecture down into multiple layers and understand how each of the technical components in this layer interact with each other within and across the layers whenever you think about the requirements consider both functional and non functional requirements functional requirements are the ones which are critical for the product to be called a successful one for example in case of twitter it's going to be user should be able to create a profile follow other profiles tweet about something scroll through the home or user timeline and like a tweet and so on whereas in case of non functional requirements it affects the user experience but not necessarily the features that are exposed to the user for example performance of the system reliability or uptime of the system and so on i know complex products like twitter will have a lot more features and requirements but for the purpose of this video let's stick to the ones that i mentioned above why is setting requirements so important before starting a design plan because most of your design will be influenced by your requirements and once you have noted down your requirements properly a lot of your technical options will be decided for you that's how powerful the influence of functional requirements is now we'll move towards breaking the entire system into smaller components so that it's better for us to visualize them as individual systems and design them better earlier when we were talking about the requirements we were looking at an eagle's point of view now we'll move from a high level design to a low level design of twitter's software architecture when you move from requirements phase to planning phase think of the system as individual layers it can be very helpful think of your product as a cake where each piece of a cake is a different feature that your product is supporting and each layer of the cake is a different component interacting with each other in the back end most usually each piece which is a feature will have all the layers which are the components which are interacting in the back end with each other i hope this horizontal and vertical slicing of features and components help you understand how a product can be designed both vertically feature by feature or horizontally component by component or usually hybrid which is the case with most of our development there are two major components when it comes to the design of any software architecture number 1 database design number 2 backend interactions how the information flows between the servers in the backend now from the requirements it's pretty clear to us that we need to leverage the functionalities of a relational sql database because there is a relation between our users and the tweets whenever a new user is created we will store that information in a new table users table we won't be storing the tweets in the users table we will have a separate table to store the tweets which will be related to the users table where the user id is going to be our foreign key 
Now, when we talk about the follower interaction, we can easily add a list of all the followers in the user's table column. But that is an inefficient design. For this purpose, we will create a new table where each column belongs to a unidirectional relationship between a profile getting followed and the profile following the other profile. At this point, we can summarize two things. There is a one-to-many relationship between the users and tweets table. A user can do multiple tweets. And there is a many-to-many -many relationship between the users for the followers relationship. One user can follow many users and many users can be followed by one user. At this point, I think our database design looks fine, but we might need to revisit this design when we are discussing the serving flows. Now, let me talk about an issue so that I can highlight you what issues can come up in the future. Let's say a user is requesting for home timeline. For this purpose, we need to find out all the profiles that the user is following. Then we need to query all the tweets done by those profiles, sort them in chronological order and then return them. Can you visualize an issue creeping up with this thing? Don't worry if you don't. I will talk about some of the important characteristics of Twitter as a product, which will help you realize what issues can come up for this serving flow. Twitter has 300 million daily active users and 6,000 tweets done every second. Also, 600,000 queries are made to fetch different timelines. This brings to light an important discovery which shows that Twitter is a read-heavy system. We are fine with eventual consistency. It's completely normal if a user is not able to see a tweet of one of the profiles eventually. Space is also not a huge constraint because all of our tweets are character limited. As we discussed in our characteristics, Twitter is a read-heavy system. So the brute force fetch operations that we were performing might not be efficient on our databases. We need something which allows us to read faster and can also scale horizontally on the fly. The first thing that comes to my mind is Redis cluster. Yes, that's how powerful the requirements are. We can't solely rely on Redis cluster, so we will be storing both the user and tweet info in the Redis cache as well as in our database for backup. With this design in mind, we can check off some of our feature requests like creating a user profile, following a user, publishing a tweet. Now let's dig a little deeper into two of our query flows where we fetch user timeline and home timeline. Let us begin with designing our user timeline flow since that's more simpler and lesser in scope as compared to our home timeline. If you remember my previous discussion, we talked about different pieces of cake and different layers inside a cake. So currently what we are trying to do is to design a piece of cake where we'll try to leverage different pieces or layers of the cake, which we have already discussed. So in order to fetch a user timeline, the first thing we need is the user ID of the timeline we want to fetch, which we can query from the users table. After we get that user ID, we will query the tweets table to get all the tweets for that particular user ID and then return it to the requesting user by sorting them in chronological order. Now, Twitter is a read heavy system and hence querying the database for this purpose can be very cost heavy. So we will introduce a caching layer in our Redis cluster, which will store all the information about the tweets that the user has made and query the information from this cache instead of querying the database since querying from cache is faster as compared to querying from the database. Now this solution might serve sufficient for our user timeline flow. Let's move on to the home timeline. Let's say I am requesting for the home timeline. For this purpose, we would require all the profiles that I follow, which we can fetch from the followers table. After getting all those user IDs, we need to fetch all the tweets made by those users from the tweet table, merge those tweets and sort them in reverse chronological order and return to the requesting user, which is me. Now we can see an obvious drawback in this solution. This solution will be very inefficient once the size of the tweets database grows to millions of data rows. For this purpose, we need to revise our serving flows and update our design. In order to overcome this issue, we will follow a fan out approach where we will move from a single data source to multiple data sources, one for each of our users. For this purpose, 
we will have an in-memory home timeline for each of the users where the home timeline will contain the tweets by all the profiles that the user is following. Now let's say I have 10 followers. So whenever I will tweet something, this tweet will flow through the load balancer into the server and stored inside the backend, both database and the cache. Now the server will query all of my 10 followers from the followers table stored in the cache and through the fanout approach, we will inject this tweet into the home timeline of all of my 10 followers we fetch from the cache. Now, one issue that might come up with this approach is, let's say I have millions of followers. Now, it's practically not possible to inject my tweet into millions of followers home timeline at runtime. For this approach, we have a special solution where we will use synchronized calls along with fanout approach. What this approach means is that for profiles who have immense amount of followers, like thousands and millions of followers, we will not inject their tweets into the home timeline of their followers. Instead, now my home timeline will only contain the tweets by the profiles that I follow and don't contain large amount of followers. So now what will happen is that my home timeline will only contain the tweets by the profiles that I follow and don't have large number of followers. Also, my followers table in the cache will store a list of profiles that I follow and have large number of followers. So during runtime, what we'll do is that we will try to send synchronous calls to all of these profiles having large number of followers and fetch their tweets and merge them with the pre-computed home timeline of the followers that I follow but don't have large number of followers. In this way, we will try to leverage both the parts where we will use the pre-computed home timeline as well as compute the tweets of the profiles that have amazing number of followers on the fly and mitigate the issue in this way. Now, there are so many other optimizations that we could deploy. Let's say for example, there are some profiles who haven't been very active lately. So for such profiles, we don't need to pre-compute the home timelines. There are so many other optimizations we could deploy, but for the sake of this software architecture design demonstration, we will restrict ourselves to only these ones and move ahead with other feature developments. Now, among the major requirements which we discussed earlier, the only piece of cake left to be designed is the search engine. For searching, Twitter uses Early Bird, which is a real-time inverted index based on Lucene. Whenever a tweet is posted, Early Bird will do an inverted full-text indexing operation. The tweet will be broken down into bits, words, and tags, and each of these words is stored or indexed into the distributed table which will contain reference to all the tweets which contain that particular word. Now let's say I search for a word, uh, for example DSA, okay. So now we will find that word in the distributed table and return the reference to all the tweets which contain the word DSA. From this reference, we will return all the tweets belonging to that reference from the tweet table. As we recollect the earlier characteristics, we know that Twitter is read heavy. It receives tremendous amount of search queries. In order to enable fast searching capability for all the users across the globe, Twitter deploys a scattering and gathering tool. What this means is that the search query is distributed across different data centers globally and each early bird shard is queried for that search operation. Now all the tweets returned from this individual shards are merged, re-ranked, sorted and then returned to the user based on the popularity of that tweet. Now I feel that we have established a very solid base for our Twitter's architecture design. We have discussed about the functional requirements as well as design for some non-functional requirements which included performance issues, scalability and by further optimizations we resolved all of those issues. Let me share a few good tips for software architecture design. Use diagrams to visualize your concepts, different technical options you have considered and any serving flow involved in your design. Now, when you are designing for the first time, don't try to fit your design to some pattern. Instead, focus on the high level design, covering all the components, how they interact with each other to avoid over engineering. Remember, your first design is just an iteration. You will move through some innumerable iterations 
to finally something that can be implemented. When you are designing, it's very natural to allow scope creeping by adding a lot of other requirements. Make sure that you discuss the functional and non-functional requirements with the stakeholders and are aligned with them. Software architecture design is more effective when there is stakeholder input and a proper mapping of requirements to design. Don't skip on this early planning and you will surely be rewarded with smoother project experience. I really hope this video was very insightful for you to start your first software architecture design from scratch. If you find this content interesting and insightful, do like this video, share your thoughts in the comment section below, make sure you subscribe Scalar's YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you never miss notifications for amazing content.